This is John Farrell from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance talking about a vision for Minnesota solar and sharing lessons and barriers from the North Star State. We started this presentation to the Minnesota Solar Energies Industry Association in November 2017 with a brief quiz. With just 37 megawatts of solar installed prior to the year 2016, Minnesota had made great strides in getting more solar. And the question we asked was, how much solar does Minnesota have now? The audience had a lot of different answers, but it turns out that about 550 megawatts are now installed in Minnesota, a more than tenfold increase in the capacity of solar. And the big picture is just as exciting as the growth of solar in Minnesota. We have annual solar PV additions far outstripping the predictions. I call this the flagpole and streamers graphic from the World Energy Organization that shows their predictions of solar growth year after year, continuing to lowball substantially the actual growth of solar energy. In fact, the predictions have been so low that um, solar growth now is forecast to provide, uh, solar PV is forecast to provide fully half of global electricity by 2050, an incredible opportunity. And of course, even by last year, we had a solar installation in the United States almost every 60 seconds. And it's getting even better because we're not just talking about using solar electricity on our grid system, but now talking about how we can use that solar electricity in different areas like transportation, where the 2018 Nissan LEAF is providing double the range as the original model and at the same price, allowing us to use our solar energy for transportation and also for home heating, uh, as with this air source heat pump. And so we're talking about an incredible opportunity where solar growth is going gangbusters, the cost of solar is coming down, and the opportunity to use solar energy is now expanding far beyond just our electricity system uh, into other kinds of technology and other sectors of our economy. So what could really get in the way in terms of taking advantage of this solar growth, accelerating this solar growth, keeping our foot on the accelerator? And the first question we have to ask ourselves is what game are we playing? Uh, and so we're going to go back to the audience here and ask, but we've got five choices. The first is rotten apples. The second is aggravation. The third is the price is right. The fourth is risk. And the final one is monopoly. We've got lots of different choices here. See a lot of people uh, coming up with different options. Uh, and the answer that I'm going to talk about is monopoly, although it's a bit of a trick question because in some ways it's really all of the above. And we want to talk first of all about this fellow, Samuel Insel. You can tell that uh, he's, um, uh, he was uh, around a long time ago because his picture is in black and white. And what he said is that there's one great advantage that must follow regulation, that advantage is protection. And what he was speaking to is, as uh, Thomas Edison's right-hand man was the agreement that he cut with um, the public sector, with uh, the legislatures, with the government to give monopoly service territories to utility companies to protect them from competition in exchange for those companies serving the public by providing ever cheaper electricity. And so you can see that uh, that was right around the turn of the 20th century, where in Wisconsin and New York, uh, and then many other states to follow, set up regulatory commissions to oversee these monopoly utility companies. And there was kind of a happy medium where these, uh, within each state, there were companies that had these monopoly service territories. They were overseen by public reg regulators. And for decades during the 20th century, this was a complementary uh, and beneficial business for both, where the utility companies made uh, secure and reasonable profits and the cost of electricity continued to fall. But the problem that we have today and the challenge that we have today when we talk about the continuing growth of things like solar energy that can be installed by individual customers uh, is that these utility companies are starting to outstrip their regulators. They're merging uh, and becoming larger. You can read more about it in a report that we've done re released recently on mergers and monopoly. Uh, but Exelon, for example, is one of the nation's largest utility companies and is a, a, a consolidation of nearly 10 different utility companies from across the country operating in both uh, regulated and restructured and competitive markets. Although, as we'll talk about, um, those things sometimes overlap in interesting ways and utilities use their power in one sector to affect the other. And so what's happening now is we're starting to see competition between utility companies and defending those monopoly service territories and the uh, powerful interests in um, 
in, in the entrepreneurial interest. So here you have a cover from Bloomberg Business Magazine uh, from last year, uh, and it was it was about the battle taking place in Nevada over rooftop solar uh, between uh, Warren Buffett's monopoly utility companies, the monopoly utility companies, and Elon Musk kind of representing the entrepreneurs, the rooftop solar industry, uh, because his company does a lot of installations uh, through release arrangements on, on those rooftops. And so the challenge we have, of course, is that um, these monopoly utility companies, uh, even though they're overseen by regulators, are struggling in order to uh, find the right balance between the co- competitive forces and these incumbent monopolies. And what you're seeing from that, uh, and when we talk about where are we going next and how are we going to continue to see the growth of solar energy, is we see that these powerful utility companies, these powerful monopolies, are using that power in order to support their business model at the expense of clean energy, at the expense of uh, customer-owned energy. So you see in, in Ohio where they're seeking subsidies for nuclear and gas power plants at the expense of competitive power. Uh, you see in Minnesota the utility company successfully using its 50 lobbyists at the legislature to overrule regulators and to get a gas power plant approved uh, through the legislature. In Nevada, you have the utility companies, as we talked about, Warren Buffett's monopoly utility companies successfully pressuring the public service commission there to eliminate net metering compensation uh, that allowed folks to get a fair price for their rooftop solar. And in Hawaii, you have what was called a bit of political jujitsu by representatives of the utility companies by placing their own amendment, a competing amendment on the ballot at a time when folks want had an amendment uh, to encourage the growth of rooftop solar. And the utility companies put up their own amendment deceptively uh, structured to sound similarly beneficial for solar, but actually just ratifying the status quo. And so we say to ourselves, we've got this enormous opportunity. Solar is growing so fast. This, uh, we have this chance to use solar in areas far beyond the original electricity system into transportation and into homes. Um, but we, we need to figure out how we can move forward. And the utility companies, the incumbents, uh, are a threat to that in some cases. The first thing I want to say, though, is that the good news is that choice can win that we don't have to accept that utility companies have power and will always wield that to success. Uh, The the amendment that utility companies put forward in Florida was defeated by voters. Uh, The net metering decision that um, ruined the rooftop solar industry for over a year in Nevada was finally reversed. Um, And so the question really is whether or not, um, not whether or not we can overcome some of those uh, pressures by incumbents to uh, move back in time instead of forward, but whether or not utilities are in a a position to lead uh, in in a system in which they have had a monopoly uh, for over 100 years in many cases. And and to understand whether or not utilities can lead, I think it's important to share this. Uh, This was a quote from a fellow from Tucson Electric Power. I gave a talk down there a couple of years ago, and uh, unbeknownst to me, the utility representatives were in the audience and invited to come up and respond after I talked about the opportunities for local renewable energy development. And during his remarks, uh, this fellow said that, you know, at a utility company, we are conservative, that we come to work each day to do what we did the day before. And I think this highlights a really important thing is that it's not necessarily whether or not utilities can uh, act in a different way, because we've seen examples of how they can uh, support distributed generation, whether that's Austin Energy's Valley of Solar or Green Mountain Power, but whether or not they are sort of uh, culturally uh, interested in doing so, but also whether or not they um, can resolve the tension between shareholder benefits and the public interest. Uh, As Abraham Lincoln famously said, an investor-owned utility divided cannot stand. Okay, well, perhaps it wasn't Abraham Lincoln who said that. Um, But the idea here is that we have, uh, like we had with the landline phone industry, Uh, a decade or two ago, uh, a significant disruption that the technologies uh, of today's uh, energy production, like solar or batteries, uh, are fundamentally different, fundamentally uh, um, uh, different both in technology and in who can own them uh, than the previous system. And to just give you an illustration of that, you know, let's have everybody raise their hand if you got, have a smartphone, and then keep your hand in the air, keep your hand up, uh, if you got that phone from your landline phone company. And of course, as happens almost everywhere, all the hands go down. 
Uh, and so the idea here is, is that we need to understand that not only are utilities culturally conservative, but that makes them perhaps unprepared to deal with uh, a system that is rapidly changing, uh, especially if the regulatory system and the rules uh, that they play under ha- is not changing similarly quick, and it, and it has not been. Uh, and, and ultimately, the, the issue for utilities is that change is coming uh, perhaps faster than they can be prepared for, and that change is named batteries. So we've talked o- earlier about solar. Solar is, of course, already a disruptive technology because it can produce energy uh, right where we use it. Um, it can be owned by customers instead of utilities. Uh, it can push pack power back onto the grid. But batteries are kind of the ultimate tool for threatening the utility monopoly because they give people uh, a different kind of power. Um, the first thing before we even get into that is just that batteries, uh, like solar, are also getting much cheaper very quickly. Uh, if you recall that chart from the beginning of the presentation that I called the pole and streamers, uh, this is similar. Uh, in 2013, a number of very um, savvy organizations, including the Federal Energy Information Administration, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and Navigant, all made predictions about the cost of energy storage in batteries. Um, over the next several decades. What's striking is that within three years, they were already too high by 50%, all of them. Even the most aggressive projections, uh, as you can see here in blue from Navigant, were far above the actual cost of battery storage. And so batteries like solar are modular. Uh, We can mass produce them, and therefore we can drive down the cost very quickly. And what that means is that we are now already seeing batteries giving customers significant choice. And when I talked about the breaking up of the monopoly, this is what I mean, is that um, utilities and the structures of their rates right now, you have commercial customers have two parts of their bill. They have a charge for the energy they use, but they also have what's called a demand charge, which is kind of like the size of the pipe that comes to their place, not the amount of the water that flows through. And demand charges are things that are very hard to avoid with conservation because you might have a certain amount, certain kinds of motors or equipment or refrigeration equipment on a, in a business property. Uh, and when they first turn on and those motors uh, rev up or the compressors start running and the power level spikes, uh, that's kind of an unavoidable peak uh, energy use. And that's what that demand charge is based on. But there are now tens, if not hundreds of thousands of customers across the country that can affordably use batteries to... Uh, to smooth out those peaks in those demand charges and to avoid those charges entirely. Uh, and that includes even up in the Midwest, uh, here in Minnesota and Iowa and in Wisconsin. And you're also seeing solar uh, being combined with energy storage in places like Hawaii, where uh, solar and storage packages can provide electricity for almost as low as half the price of grid electricity uh, provided by the utility companies. And so what this ultimately means is that the choices that customers have now with storage combined with solar are allowing them to talk about cord cutting in the same way that we did with mobile phones in the landline phone industry. This disruption comes from the outside. It's not developed by the utilities. It's not owned by the utilities. It's not controlled by the utilities. And it's giving customers the chance to do something very different. So I want to conclude, you know, by we've talked a lot about this enormous opportunity for solar, about the way that utilities are challenged to take advantage of it in a way that Um, because of their uh, conservative nature, the way that the regulation of the system sets up, and also just simply the fact that innovation tends to come from the outside. Let's talk about what Minnesota has done right in terms of getting solar to grow so quickly, as you remember that slide earlier, where solar capacity has grown over tenfold in the last two years. Uh, One thing that we did here in Minnesota is that we created a solar energy standard. We said that we need to carve out a little space for solar to grow to give installers experience to give utilities experience to make sure that we can get some uh, th- th- get this market started. And you can see uh, that our standard is actually fairly modest compared to a lot of other states, uh, but also in the dotted line that we are growing uh, and already have installed uh, more solar than that standard requires. So it was a very successful way to jumpstart the market in Minnesota uh, to get interest uh, in solar started. Uh, and to get projects in the ground. Um, but we also, I think even more crucially, preserve fair pricing for distributed solar by creating what's called the value of solar. So requiring utilities to make a calculation of all of these different factors uh, related to solar, avoided fuel costs, avoided um, transmission capacity costs, avoided generation capacity, and avoided environmental costs when we switch to clean fuels from dirty fuels. Uh, and that's a way for us to make sure that we can avoid some of those fights like took place in Nevada, uh, or other states about what is the value of solar energy and how much is reasonable for the utility to pay. 
Um, and as you can see there, the value of solar calculation in the last time that Excel Energy did it, the largest utility here in Minnesota, was 12.3 cents per kilowatt hour, kilowatt hour uh, slightly higher than uh, the actual retail price for electricity. So an important thing to know that in general, in the past, when we talk about solar and what its value has been to the system, people who produce energy from solar are usually giving more value to the grid than they are getting back in terms of compensation under net metering in Minnesota. Um, uh, in addition to the value of solar and the solar energy standard, we expanded on-site generation capacity for investor-owned utilities uh, in 2013 to allow for larger projects. Um, we also enabled community solar. In fact, Minnesota's community solar program with now almost 170 megawatts of installed capacity, as shown in that chart, is the largest in the country and the best designed program. Uh, and you can see more about that in our um, uh, monthly coverage where we report on the statistics uh, from Minnesota's community solar program, but also talk about the design features of that program that make it so successful. Uh, many other states are now exploring community solar. Lots of rural electric cooperatives, if you can see represented by the red pins on this chart, uh, are also jumping in, and, and particularly in Minnesota. And I think that's because of the policy requiring Excel Energy customers uh, to have access to community solar uh, owned by non-utility participants that these other utilities have become interested. You can see the other area of large activity for co-ops is Colorado, which was the first state uh, to really move ahead with community solar. Uh, we've also got solar on schools in Minnesota. Uh, now, um, uh, this project was outside the Red Wing High School in Red Wing, Minnesota, and it is projected to save the school district $7.7 million over 25 years. And there are many other school districts that have been able to take advantage. And of course, saving money for school districts is one of the best things that we can do because it saves everybody money when we're saving public institutions money. Uh, and so it's been a great way to grow solar in Minnesota and to do it in a way that benefits everyone. So what more can Minnesota do? What more can we do to seize this opportunity of uh, enormous amounts of solar? Um, and I just want to highlight that opportunity really quickly here, that um, when we talk about how much energy that we can get from solar, uh, it, just from rooftops alone of residential and commercial buildings, it's a lot, almost 40% of the electricity sold on an annual basis in Minnesota could come from rooftops alone. So the amount that we have now around 1% or 2% uh, based on our solar energy standard is only a tiny fraction of the potential uh, that we could use uh, in Minnesota. And, and we get also... Um, and, and we've been taking advantage of the fact that the solar is getting cheaper at the same time that electricity prices are getting higher. So growing solar is a benefit to customers by helping them uh, stave off these rising electricity prices. So we can keep on building. We can keep on growing Minnesota community solar energy capacity because it's a way for people who don't have access to solar on their rooftop uh, to have access to solar. And we have lots, uh, as much as 400 megawatts of new projects still in the queue and under development. Uh, and so promising prospects for seeing more growth in solar in Minnesota, uh, in community solar. Uh, we can start adding storage to projects. Uh, it's a great uh, um, conference uh, earlier this year looked at uh, in Minnesota looking at the opportunities for storage in the Midwest and as we showed on that chart earlier there are a number of commercial businesses that can already affordably use storage uh, to avoid demand charges but we can also use it to uh, combine with solar to make solar more available during peak energy demand times in late afternoon in the summer uh, or to use those batteries to assist the utility in uh, preserving the quality of power on the grid uh, and even to avoid uh, threats of uh, uh, brownouts or blackouts. Um, we can also look at how community renewable energy could be expanded to wind. Uh, we have a terrific wind resource in Minnesota and an opportunity, again, where people could invest in renewable energy uh, that's near their community uh, through wind projects. Um, and, and it's a, a, a style of community renewable energy that we don't see in most places. Most folks... Most states and most utilities that have looked at community renewable energy have only done so. Uh, but that's a disservice uh, here in the Midwest where wind is particularly inexpensive. Um, a couple other things that we can do, we can uh, pass inclusive energy financing. We can require utilities or work with utilities to get them to adopt tariff-based inclusive financing where a customer, regardless of their credit score, can get access to capital to invest in energy savings improvements, whether that's insulation or windows or rooftop solar panels or even the share of solar on a nearby building. The utility or through a bank that passes the money through the utility fronts those costs for those energy savings improvements. Part of the savings uh, 
is used to pay for the improvements and part of the savings is reducing the customer's energy bill. And it doesn't require doing a credit score or using loans uh, and is an important way to act for folks to access energy savings uh, who have not been able to through our typically loan-based financing and rebate uh, programs for energy savings. We also need to defend the right to sell power uh, into the market, and this is particularly important for community-scale projects. There's a project in Minnesota right now uh, resolving uh, or in a dispute at the Utilities Commission uh, with the utility company uh, a couple of wind turbines and a solar panel, about 5 megawatts, that wants to sell power uh, to that utility company. And under federal law, the utility is required to buy that power. But the, the debate right now is about what price. And most projects are only able to get a price reflective of avoiding generation costs, which you can see there is represented uh, by three cents, which is an approximation for most utilities about the div division of costs to deliver power, three cents for generation, three cents for transmission, and four cents for distribution. But the key here is what's that fair price? That if we are talking about projects that can interconnect and deliver power much closer to where we use it, then that price should be higher and should account for that delivery. Uh, and that's one of the things that uh, this complaint is going to illustrate in Minnesota and that uh, we hope there will be future proceedings as well uh, at the Public Utilities Commission looking at how we get that fair price. And ultimately then what we're talking about is shifting the system from one of energy monopoly where power flows in a single direction, both uh, in terms of electricity from utility scale power generation to customers, uh, but now to a system where power comes from renewable energy resources that are placed all over uh, um, the, the network and owned by many different actors. Uh, but we also shrink the political power of utilities uh, as we do that and give customers more say and more choice uh, over their energy future. Thank you so much for listening. You can find more presentations like this at ILSR.org or on John Farrell's SlideShare channel, and more of our research and underlying data for the presentation at ILSR.org.